Coming up on this edition of The Climate Show, we talk about a brand new report that's just been released this week by the Australian Climate Commission. And we've got Dr James Hansen, the um, world-famous climate scientist who's been touring New Zealand. We managed to grab half an hour's chat with him. And John Cook is back as well, fresh from his book tour. It's all coming up on this edition of The Climate Show. This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by Celsius.co.nz Hottopic.co.nz Skepticalscience.com Scoop.co.nz And KiwiFit. to The Climate Show, episode number 13. The Climate Show is a show all about climate science, news, policy, politics, and we put the solutions in there as well. Plus, we debunk the sceptics. I'm your host, Glenn Williams, and also my co-host, Gareth Rinaldin in Waipata, North Canterbury. Hello, Gareth. Good morning, Glenn. How are you? Good, good. It's been um, an extra long time between shows uh, because we wanted to make sure that in this episode we got our very 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 special superstar climate guest <laughs> on <laughs> yeah we've got we've got the grandfather of global warming um dr james hansen who is possibly the world's best known climate scientist and uh we were absolutely delighted to be able to find um, a, a sort of half hour with him to be granted half an hour with him during his tour. Now let's, so be, we let's be clear, he didn't start global warming, did he? He he, rung, he was the first to ring the bell, is that right? Yeah, pretty much. He, he made a, um, uh, he testified to the US Congress in 1988, which was the first time that anybody really kind of sat up and, and took notice of the potential size of the issue that confronted the world and it this predated the foundation of the well it, it led it indirectly or directly to the foundation of the ipcc and um the the whole sort of kyoto process that we've seen over the last 20 years so mm. yeah very very influential guy um now very very active in um trying to persuade the world to leave fossil fuels in the ground but we'll talk more about that with jim yeah, we will. Um, you might be watching the show and you might be getting it through um, the YouTube channel um, on uh, theclimateshow.com or hot-topic.co.nz or even up at skepticalscience.com. But there is a, an audio version as well, and you can find that in um, iTunes. There's a link up in the show notes. Uh, in fact, all the notes uh, will be up in link form and um, a full rundown of the show up at theclimateshow.com and um, hot-topic.co.nz. You can also search in iTunes as well. Um, there's our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the climate show and twitter.com forward slash the climate show as well. And um, let's also talk about what we were talking about in the last show about how we were going to um, fund certain things that we want to do with the show um, going forward. And we did get a bit of feedback, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And it was very encouraging. And um, yeah, so Glenn and I are investigating a couple of ways of which we can have a a kind of donation jar or a tip jar for people to put money in. Um, we want to keep this very transparent so that, you know, we'll, we'll, we're doing a budget of the various sort of cost elements of, of running the show and uh, we'll get something going in the next, in the next uh, couple of shows, I guess. Yes. It will be up on Hot Topic and it will be up on the Climate Show website. So that's good. The other thing that um, I was very pleased about was uh, we had an email uh, from a lady called Anna Maria uh, Muller um, from Alaska and she uh, did us a transcript of the interview with Olaf Morgenstern from the last show and I just wanted to first of all thank Anna Maria for, for taking the time and the trouble to do that absolutely fantastic yeah amazing. really good quality yeah um, and what Glenn and I have um, discussed and we think we're going to do as <laughs> Glenn's the whiz who's going to have to do it um, is to start a wiki site and we'll post um, transcripts up there as we get them hmm. and hopefully we can crowdsource bits of the um, bits of the, the the transcripts as they come in so i'm hoping that anna maria will um 
not get frightened away by this. I'm hoping that she'll uh, have a listen to uh, the Hanson interview and have a go at that. So I'd just like to thank Anna Maria for her for efforts in doing it. And it's really good to know that we've got somebody, we've got, well, first of all, got a listener in Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. a viewer in Alaska, yeah. <laughs> which, um, which is great. I think it's I asked her, astounding, I, isn't it? I did, I did ask her if it was like Northern Exposure, if you remember that old TV series, Northern Exposure. Yes. And um, she says, yes, they do have moose in the streets where she lives. <laughs> yeah. In fact, <laughs> um, I, reading that email of something about someone uh, or something that featured in it was actually just down the road. Uh, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. Very yeah. cool. No, and uh, she knows the person who um, raised the moose that featured in That's the right. title sequence for, for Northern Exposure. So yeah. it's an extraordinarily small planet we live on, Glenn. And it's great. And this exercise of just figuring out, well, what, what do people want to do? Do they want to help out? Do they want to donate? Do they want to uh, transcribe? has been a, a great exercise in figuring out, well, how is this... Uh, climate show community going to work, and how how big is it around the world? In fact, where where is everyone? I think it's um, it's 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 been a really nice, um, heartwarming um, exercise. So it's very very cool. And so we will we'll yeah. start to get these things going. It's heartwarming and cool at the same time. I like that. Man. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, well, um, I think that's that's all we need to do uh, need to deal with that. I think we can move on to the news and um, and first up a little bit of a roundup of. Uh, Jim Hansen's tour around New Zealand. Yes, he's um, he's been very very busy. Um, the group of people, the, the sort of coalition of people who brought him over, um, got a, a really got a, he had a really full um, sort of itinerary. He's been to Auckland, uh, Palmerston North. He's been to Wellington. He took part in a uh, seminar on on the future of coal. Um, while he was in Wellington. A lot of media then, as well, heaps of media. Oh, absolutely. He was on the Kim Hill show. He was on TV One. Um, yeah, that, absolutely fantastic job. Um, I think the in general too, I mean, he's been in every major newspaper. Um, so I, I think in general, the, the response from the New Zealand media to Jim's presence has been fantastic. And uh, his message has been um, got out with very little pushback, I would have said, from mm. um, the, the, those who oppose action, and that's always good. Um, I think the only the only substantial pushback uh, was on the Facebook site <laughs> for the tour, where one or two of um, New Zealand's more vocal um, denialists were, were 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 attempting basically to derail discussion. There uh, didn't really work, and made them look a bit stupid. But you know, that's what denialists are and yeah. and it's the way they behave so that's fine but no it was a fantastic um tour um we were able to catch up with him in christchurch on friday he had a very busy day there at the university of canterbury um he saw he gave an interview to the press which was featured on saturday then he came along to the university um spent some time with with me and his team then into a public lecture which i attended which was absolutely stuffed with people um, including an overflow outside, and then on he had uh, he spent some time in the university signing books and meeting people, and uh, gave a public lecture that um, that afternoon or early evening uh, in town. So, yeah, fantastic and and <laughs> interesting too that there's been a bit of a I won't call it a stoush, but um, Don Elder, the um, CEO of Solid Energy, uh, New Zealand's uh, coal and lignite exploiter. Yeah. Um, rather took exception to Jim turning up and telling New Zealand that it was a, a moral issue and that we should be leaving coal in the ground. And my co-blogger, um, uh, Brian Walker, did a very nice post about that. So, yeah, Jim's rattled a few cages, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, in New Zealand's terms, uh, we really do need to think about what we do with our fossil fuel resources. Mm. And it does look as though um, government policy here is intent on encouraging people to drill for oil, exploit coal and uh, burn lignite or convert lignite into diesel or, or, or other things. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, which is uh, it's uh, kind of, the, it's, it's the wrong direction, you know? The, yeah. the, every country in the world needs to be looking away from fossil fuels and towards alternatives. Well, and to have a government that is kind of putting the settings uh, in the economy towards those things, I think is just uh, not not 
terribly clever. Yeah, I guess um, to to give an idea to people outside of New Zealand, um, it's the current government that we've had for the past three years um, that we now have a real fight on our hands um, to to stop some of um, some of their uh, exploration, um, deep sea drilling, this lignite mining. Um, I, I saw also the other day a news story about um, some possible mining that might go ahead in the top bit of the, um, of, the, of the South Island of New Zealand, which is a beautiful national park area and is really treasured by uh, people all over the country. And it looks like um, there's an old fossil himself who wants to go hunting. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, yeah. and and the ridiculous thing about that, I mean, I know that part of New Zealand really, really well. I've holidayed there almost every year since I got to the country and sailed around the area and walked the um, the parks, walked the pathways in the national parks. It's just, I mean, the Abel Tasman National Park is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Golden Bay is a fantastic, um, a fantastic, a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, uh, and and a, a kind of oasis mm. of, of 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 beauty in a in a, a world of, of of toil and strife. And I always kind of breathe a deep sigh of relief when I get into the region, and and, and I just love it to bits. Yeah. And you, it's the sort of place where you can go out on a boat and you can see killer whales. You can see huge numbers of birds. You can still sling a hook over the back of the boat and catch a blue cod or or. Um, a kingfish or whatever and, and grill it on the back of the boat when you pull up for the night. It's just the most wonderful part of the world. And these guys want to go and start drilling for oil. They want to um, reopen old coal mines. They want to dredge, it, dredge the bay so they can get their ships in to get the coal out. They're talking about trillions of dollars worth of, of resources being available there. Mm. And I mean, really, seriously, do we have to trash our country just for the sake of somebody else's profit? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Glenn. But don't, don't. I think we ought to stop there, otherwise I'll get very, very cross. <laughs> we don't want. To, we don't want an angry <laughs> show. Let's move on to um, t- to the next story. Um, this is good. Uh, the Australian Climate Commission has released a new report. Um, the critical decade. It's called. Yes, absolutely. That um, is news this morning. We're recording this show on Monday, May the 23rd, and this report is released today. Um, the Climate Commission is an independent advisory body um, in, in Australia. Um, it consists of scientists and, and advisors to the government. And this report really pulls no punches. It's, it's called The Critical Decade, and the key messages are um, there's no doubt that climate change is here it's, it's, and that climate is changing. The evidence is overwhelming. We're already seeing the social, economic and environmental impacts of the changing climate, and particularly in Australia. And I really would urge people to go and have a look at the, the full report. The links will be up on the site. But if you just Google Climate Commission Australia, you'll find it. It's um, very, very clear. Got some excellent graphics in it. It also says the third key message is that human activities are triggering the changes we're witnessing in the global climate. And most important of all, and this actually fits in very nicely with the message that um, Jim Hansen was giving to his audiences in New Zealand. This is the critical decade. Decisions we make from now to 2020 will determine the severity of climate change our children and grandchildren will experience. And that's absolutely the most important point. Every every year that we delay now um, is making the suffering in the future worse. And we're absolutely certain there will be suffering. And we're absolutely certain we know, we know what to do. So as the report says, this decade is critical. Unless effective action is taken, the global climate may be so irreversibly altered, um, we will struggle to maintain our present way of life. The choices we make this decade will shape the long-term climate future of our children and grandchildren. Mm. And yet it's absolutely great to see that this sort of very, very clear statement about what's required and of course when you put that into the Australian context where you've got a a very finely balanced political situation with the Labour-led government um, sort of only with a very very slim majority and you've got Tony Abbott the leader of the opposition who is a um, a climate change um, denier um, whose party is is espousing climate change denial in in about as obvious a way as the Republicans in the US and um, to have a, an independent report that 
if you like, bangs the table and makes this point as clearly as this is is fantastic. So it's, I actually, it's, it's independent, but it's been organised by the government. So will it drive government policy in Australia? Yeah, well, I think it ought to. I mean, Julia Gillard is talking about um, adding a carbon tax or bringing in a carbon tax, having, having um, declined to do an emissions trading scheme. She's talking about putting in a carbon tax. Uh, the politics is complicated and the balance fine. And we might want we might ask John Cook when we get him on um, for his take on this. But I, my feeling is that it, we're going to talk about um, the experience in Britain shortly. But when you get a country where climate change is taken seriously, you get policy settings that you know are pointing in the right. It would it would cheer me up greatly if we could have a body in New Zealand that produced a report as clear and as direct and as to the point as this Climate Commission report mm. in Australia. And but, but it's we, the we, sort we, of... We, we've got a Prime Minister who says, oh, look, one scientist might say this, but I can find you a dozen uh, just like lawyers that'll say something else. <laughs> I know. I, it was a, a depressing example, and I rather hope that um, Sir Peter Gluckman, who's the um, science advisor to the... the Prime Minister's personal yeah. science advisor yeah. actually took him to one side and said, no, John, that's not how it works. I, but I, I would really, I, I wonder, I would really I love to have a bit of paper like this that yeah. we could actually wave at. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a parliamentary commissioner of the environment who has produced some really good reports on um, the need for action on climate change. But it seems that, you know, politicians feel free to ignore um, that statutory body. Uh, I don't know. What do we need? We need, we need? we need the Royal Society. We need the, the academic community in New Zealand to um, really refuse to be ignored by, by politicians. Um, and I know that there are many academics who, who share that view. Mm. Um, I'm, you know, it, would be, it would be very cheering to me if we could have such a clear statement of policy to, to, to whack under the noses. What's, what's actually interesting about this is though, that they're not saying... Um, you know, you must have a carbon tax, you must have a um, an ETS, or you must do any particular policy prescription. What they're saying is, this is done, now go away and work out how to do it. Mm. And that to me is 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 um, very, very, uh, very, very direct, and it's the sort of thing. We need to have policy that works within the laws of physics, not pretends that the laws of physics can be ignored. Indeed. Um, moving along now to a um, story from the UK where it shows that they might also be, uh, well, moving along a lot faster than what we are here. Um, they're pledging to half the UK carbon emissions by 2025. Yes, absolutely. Well, the UK is, is um, pretty much unique in that they have, um, the government has a kind of an advisory commission um, which takes the science and sets budgets or, or produces budgets on carbon that the government has to consider. And what the, there was a bit of a political stoush in Britain about it. Um, I think the finance minister um, didn't want to accept these budgets, wanted them loosened. Um, but in the end, the environment minister, a guy called Chris Hewn, um, announced to parliament that the carbon budget proposed uh, would be accepted. And that is that there would be a 50% emissions cut averaged across the years 2023 to 2027 compared with 1990 levels and that this would be enshrined in law. So not only have we got what has to be one of the world's most ambitious um, carbon emissions targets, um, you know, New Zealand's talking about 50% by 2050. Here's Britain saying, well, okay, we'll do that by 2025. Um, but you're also, you've got a country which is giving itself a legal commitment to do it. Yeah. And, yeah, it just shows how different things can be when you've got a government which has got, a, um, got its advice in order, um, takes the problem seriously. Now, that doesn't mean that um, the British government necessarily is going to be able to deliver what it promises. And, I mean, there's uh, plenty to argue about in, in, in British politics about the ways in which government policy is perhaps not adding up to delivering the sorts of targets that they're willing to commit to. And, you know, you could argue, well, 2025 is, is still, you know, 14 years away. Um, that's 
uh, three bites of the of the electoral sherry at least in Britain, where they have a five year election cycle. Yeah. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to say that now. It's much harder to actually do the 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 the, the sort of business of, of putting it in place. And the other the other thing that struck me about this story, it's a the story comes from the Guardian, and although there were some businesses um, who were you know some business. Uh, lobbyists who were complaining about the target, the most powerful of the the, the, the business uh, groups in the in Britain is is the Confederation of British Industry, mm. which used to be you know kind of the, the the Thatcherite heartland, the free market heartland of of, of the British economy, but um, the director of policy at the CBI is a um, lady called Katya Hall said. We support a 50% emissions reduction target by 2025, huh. but we need the right short-term policies. And they're talking about the green economy potentially bringing in £200 billion sterling of investment into the UK's energy sector. So, you know, that's what I call solid business advice. And actually, just to mention Hansen again, it was he had a number of meetings with um, New Zealand businesses who are committed to a a clean energy and a, a clean tech future. So it is happening in New Zealand, but you know we still have that message has to get through to the kind of business lobbyists who tend to hog the news. And I'm thinking of the business round table or the Employers and Manufacturers Federation, yeah. who are still, I think, stuck in the last century. But there we are. We've still got some John Cook um, on the way. He's going to be talking about his um, his book and uh, the full tour that he's done. Um, with the book as well and very shortly Dr James Hansen Jim Hansen will be with us as well but first up I do want to thank um, a couple of media partners for the climate show that's scoop.co.nz um, they feature the climate show up the top of their um, of their site once it's released which is um, very nice um, of them and helps us gain a few more followers around the world and also Celsius C-E-L-S-I-A-S.co.nz as well thanks very much to those two and also, I think, Glenn, it's worth saying that actually all of our listeners and viewers are our media partners. So Indeed. if you've got a if you've got a blog site or a website or if you've got um, a Facebook page or, you know, whatever, and you like what you're hearing and seeing, then, you know, spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. So time for our um, feature interview and possibly one of the biggest guests we've had on uh, the climate show. It is uh, Dr. James Hansen or Jim as he's like to um, li- likes to be called, and he joined um, Gareth. Um, I had to butt out of this one, and technically it wasn't going to be all all that much possible. Um, I had to butt out, so Gareth spoke with um, Jim down at the University of Canterbury on Friday. Uh, with me today in uh, Canterbury University is Dr. James Hansen, who's the director of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies. Jim, uh, it's great to have you with us and on the climate show. Um, you're touring New Zealand this week um, talking about coal and you had a a bit of a day with um, Don Elder who's the uh, CEO of Solid Energy. Um, His reaction was that you should not be in New Zealand telling us what to do. What's your sort of reaction to that? Well first of all I have to admit that the United States is emitting much more CO2 than New Zealand about five tons per person while New Zealand is just over two tons per person. But the science tells us that we're not going to be able to burn all of the remaining coal in the ground and the tar sands and all of those uh, dirtiest fuels or we create a situation that's out of control for young people and future generations. So, And uh, New Zealand's uh, coal, the um, lignite, is uh, not a negligible contributor if it is developed. It's just a perfect example of the stuff that we've got to leave in the ground. So you were down in Gaul yesterday and you had a chance to see the, the sort of site there. What, what sort of impression did you have? Well, it looked, it looked like the mountaintop removal to me. You know, they're just beginning, so it's not yet that big a scar. But where you can see it, it is a scar on the landscape. And as I say, that's the kind of stuff that really is much better off being left in the ground because if we burn that, we're going to, young people are going to have to figure out how to get it back out of the atmosphere. So economically, it makes absolutely no sense averaged over the lives of our children. Uh, It makes sense only for a few people now who will uh, pad their wallets 
but uh, the rest of the people on the planet and the other species on the planet will be paying for that. Yeah. So over the, the, the tour of New Zealand, what, what sort of reaction do you think you've been getting? We've been getting strong feedback on the blog saying, you know, that, that people have been enjoying your message. And, and Well, yeah, I, I really think it's really encouraging that uh, people here are uh, listening and, and discussing the issue in an intelligent way. And I think that's really what has to happen. If the public gets informed on this and gets involved in the decision making, it will be a different path then if we leave it to the politicians who are so strongly influenced by those people, the special interests who have potential economic gains, if we let those people play together and make the decisions, then the planet and uh, young people and other species are in trouble. Yeah, that's one of the strongest messages that's come through from all of the things that you've been saying and doing over the last couple of years, really, is it that the, there's a very big disconnect between what the, the politicians say they're doing and then what's actually happening. And I imagine in the US with uh, moves to um, frack for uh, gas and tar sands and all the rest of it, it's, it's probably even worse than here. Yeah, it's, uh, it is the same almost everywhere, even, even in the greenest country. I'm trying to find one nation where the leaders will stand up and tell the truth and really put a country on the right track. And Norway, I thought, was the best place because, and in fact, they are trying very hard. They've reduced their emissions within their borders 30%, but yet they're going to the Arctic to drill and they're developing tar sands in Canada, the dirtiest fuel on the planet. So there's really no country as yet that's really uh, facing reality and, and, and standing up telling the truth. What do you think it will take to, to get politicians the policy makers to actually really take this seriously? Well, I think it's going to be a combination of things, but it's going to have to involve the public. I mean, we're, there are some court cases being filed against the United States government, for example, the federal government and some state governments that try to force them to do their job and protect the rights of young people. Yeah. But unless there's a public outcry courts don't tend, to, you know, in the case of civil rights, it only occurred, the courts finally came to the right side on that, but only after the public had become really interested and had begun to protest. So there's a, do you think there's a kind of tipping point in, in public opinion when, you know, the, the, the mood for change will become something that politicians can't ignore? Yes, but we haven't reached that tipping point. You know, yeah. the number of people who are realizing what's going on and you know that is the real problem because in some ways in some countries we've gone backwards in the last few years because of the very effective campaigns of those people who want to continue business as usual and confuse the public make the science appear very uncertain or even make it they even making the argument that it's a fraud you know yeah. and People, well, they kind of like that message. It's a lot more convenient if you believe that this is all uncertain or maybe even made up. But unfortunately, the science has been getting clearer and clearer at the same time the public has become less well-informed. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I actually spent last night reading three of your most recent papers, so <laughs> I feel like I... I I, I want to ask you about some of those things now. Um, um, one of them, uh, one of the papers that really struck me was your paper about energy imbalance, and the um, the, the what you called the Faustian bargain with with aerosols. Um, so I wondered if you could just explain what you mean by that Faustian bargain with aerosols. Well, the Faustian bargain with aerosols is the fact that aerosols actually have a cooling effect by reflecting sunlight. And they have counteracted about half of the warming effect due to CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases. The problem is that the CO2 stays in the atmosphere, stays in the surface carbon reservoirs for millennia. The aerosols stay in the atmosphere about five days. And as long as we keep pumping them up there, then they're counteracting half of the effect. But pretty soon, we're going to reduce that air pollution because the aerosols are the air pollution that you can see. And it's not healthy, it's uh, not desired by the people in China and India who are the main ones putting it up now. And so they're going to clean that up. 
it's amazingly obvious from space because I look at the NASA Earth Observatory pictures on a regular basis and some of the pictures of haze over China and over India and so on, they're quite staggering that you know, vast areas of the planet are getting swathed in this kind of brown muck. Yeah, and, and that's the, the payment for that is going to come due at some point because they're not going to want to keep a dirty atmosphere forever. So this um, paper, that the, 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 um, the energy imbalance paper, basically you were arguing that um, the generation of models that we're using at the moment are um, underrepresent, or sorry, overrepresenting the amount of heat being pumped into the deep ocean, which means that we are building, we, 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 then we may have more of an aerosol effect than we uh, had believed. Is that the case? Yes, there's, because we're not measuring the aerosol amount, we have to sort of infer it indirectly yeah. and with the help of climate models. And those models are not perfect. And we're beginning to understand what their biggest flaws are. And one of those flaws is that they mix heat too much into the deep ocean unrealistically. And now that we're beginning to get measurements of that, we see that the models have been putting in too little aerosols to compensate for the uh, excess excess mixing in the oceans. So they've been getting the right answers, but with the wrong mix of... of yeah. yeah. Although this, this is kind of a, a technical issue, which doesn't... The, the real fundamental fact is that what we do have now is these really uh, great measurements from 3,000 floats distributed around the world ocean which now allow us to measure how far the planet is out of energy balance. Yeah. And that's the most fundamental number describing the state of the Earth's planet. It tells us how much warming is still in the pipeline. It's going to occur over coming decades because as long as there's more energy coming in and going out, the planet is going to continue to get warmer. Yeah. It tells us also how much we would need to reduce the greenhouse gases if we want to restore the energy balance, which is what is needed to stabilize the climate. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is just go back to the paper before, which is one that you wrote about um, partic with particular reference to the Eemian, which was the last interglacial. And the fact that we, uh, I often use the Eemian when I'm talking to people as an example that you know, there, there was a, a time 120 odd thousand years ago when, when carbon was 300 parts per million and the oceans were six meters higher and there were alligators in the Thames, you know, which is a, you know, it, it, it sort of makes people think hard about where we are at 390 parts per million. But I think your paper was arguing that the EMIAN, the best, the best data we have for the EMIAN is that it was only fractionally warmer than now. Yes. You know, when scientists looked at the ice cores, they saw that Greenland and Antarctica were as much as three or four degrees Celsius warmer during the Eemian than they are now. And it kind of, so the IPCC used that type of information to say that, well, the dangerous level may be two or three degrees of warming. Unfortunately, the ice sheets are not representative of the global average temperature change. And what we see in looking at the ocean core data from all around the global ocean, we have these cores and we can see how much warmer the ocean was during the Eemian. And it was less than one degree Celsius warmer. And that's a, a better measure of the global temperature change than the top of an ice sheet because at the top of the ice sheet, the change gets amplified. Yeah. So it means we're, we really are getting close to the level uh, of climate change, which is going to be dangerous. And that's consistent with the fact that we see the ice sheets are not in balance now. They are losing mass at a rate of a, a few hundred cubic kilometers of ice per year. Yeah. Now, you talk in the paper, too, about um, Arctic tipping points, and obviously the, the, the fate of the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet are those, but there are other very worrying things going on in the Arctic with the, the, the reduction in sea ice and the possibility of methane bubbling. Yes, the sea ice is important. The sea yeah. ice and the ice shelves. The ice shelves are the ice that comes out from the ice sheet and extends into the ocean. Those... Uh, 
provide some protection for the ice sheets. And once that sea ice melts back, and once those ice shelves melt, and they are losing mass now, that will make the ice sheet much more vulnerable and increase the likelihood that we will get rapid uh, disintegration of the ice sheets and sea level rise. Yes, and in one of the papers you talk about um, an impending um, acceleration in sea level rise as a result of this warming in the pipeline and the fate of the ice sheet. And I think we're currently seeing three centimeters a decade, but you've right. written in the past about um, uh, rapid, rapid increases well above that. Do you want to give us an idea of what we might expect? Well, the accurate data uh, began only in year 2003 when we launched the gravity satellite, which measures the gravitational field so accurately that we can now see the, the mass balance of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. So that record is too short to say we have empirical evidence of how rapidly things are going to change. But we can see just over that period, the rate of mass loss has almost doubled. So if that doubling continues for several more decades, then we are going to get to the point where we begin to see meter scale sea level rise. And it's, it's a tough problem. It's a nonlinear problem. We don't have models of ice sheets that can tell us how rapidly they will disintegrate. But we do know from the Earth's history that there have been times when an ice sheet uh, disintegrated at a rate such that sea level went up uh, one meter in like 20 years for many, for a few consecutive centuries. So you got multi sea level rise, uh, meter sea level rise. Yeah, that's um, that the, during the Eemian, there's uh, evidence that I, I gather is is not totally accepted within the scientific community, but there certainly is some evidence of multi meter rises at the, the height of the Eemian um, when it was at its warmest. Now, those are really quite sort of nasty bits of news for us. Yeah, well, that's a very the very interesting, uh, some of the recent uh, uh, examinations of shorelines in the uh, Caribbean, which was a, a tectonically stable region. So it's a very good place to look and try to understand the time dependence of sea level rise. And especially the papers by Paul Hardy and some of his colleagues, they find that the sea level during the Eemian was a few meters higher than it is now. And then near the end of the Eemian, it went up quite rapidly by several meters additional. And that's, uh, that's worrisome because that's the kind of thing which we're uh, afraid may be happening in the near future. Absolutely, because the ice sheets at that time would have been roughly the same sort of size as they are now. So yes. it indicates that the ice that we've got is possibly not as stable as we'd like it to be. Yeah. One thing about reading those three papers last night, and I want to talk about the third one um, briefly, um, it's got the most unusual title for a, for a scientific paper, and that's the, the case for young people and nature, a path to a healthy, natural, prosperous future. And I'd just like to say the author list on that is, um, if I may use the vernacular, an awesome author list. You've got some really, um, really big um, names on there with you. But it's a... It's, um, it's, it's not what you'd call your, your typical um, scientific paper title. Can you explain why you, why you took that approach? Uh, well, partly because we want to point out that it's not just a gloom and doom story. If we take the right actions, then the world that uh, young people and future generations would have would actually be in some ways better than the current one if we'd clean up the atmosphere and, and, and water pollution. Uh, and go to clean energies and energy efficiency. But what we show in that paper, that's the word a path, tells our idea was to define how rapidly we would need to phase down the fossil fuel emissions if we want to restore the planet's energy balance and stabilize climate. And it turns out that we have to reduce CO2 emissions at 5 or 6% per year. If we begin soon, if we wait another decade, then if you want to stabilize things by the end of this century, you would need to reduce emissions more like 10% a year, which begins to be implausible. Yeah. 
And it, the, the nasty message in that paper too is that the longer we leave it, the higher the stabilization level, unless we start to do something dramatic like, you know, actively suck carbon out of the atmosphere. I mean, you, you include in your projections um, a sort of forestry offset by assuming that people plant lots of trees. Is that the largest that we could do naturally, or are there other ways that we could, we could approach the issue? Well, I think that our assumption was probably close to the maximum that is plausible, because we assumed 100 gigatons of carbon, uh, restoring that into forests and the soil. And that's what, about 50 parts per million, something like that, in the atmosphere? Um, it is uh, to, yeah, that's about 50 parts per yeah. million, initially. But any emission to the atmosphere or extraction from the atmosphere eventually gets distributed among the surface reservoirs, the atmosphere and the ocean uh, and the biosphere. Uh, but that's about equal to the deforestation that has occurred over the last two centuries. So it's a tall order, but it, it is possible, I think, because the forest will take up more now because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. It makes yeah. the, the trees grow um, and take up more carbon. And if we also take steps with better agricultural practices to keep more carbon in the soil, then I think it's, it's feasible to get 100 gigatons out. And um, do you think there's any scope for um, the machines sucking CO2 out of the air? You've spoken in the past about the possibility of burning um, biomass and carbon sequestration and burying that carbon to take it out of the system. Do you think that's realistic? Well, it's going to be very expensive. You, there's a recent study, which I actually don't refer to in that paper yet, it's, it just came out in the last few weeks, which estimates a cost of about $1,000 a, uh, a, a ton, and which means that you'd be talking of the order of $100 trillion to get 50 um, ppm out of the atmosphere permanently, which would require uh, more than 50 gigatons extracted because that extraction is going to get distributed among the surface reservoirs. Absolutely. So as soon as we start sucking carbon out of the air, the oceans will start giving us some back as well. So yes, it gets, that's it gets exactly slower. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, I know that you're about to disappear off and, and give a public lecture at the University of Canterbury. So I don't want to um, keep you around for too long. I, I, your minders will be at my throat shortly, I expect. <laughs> But um, yeah. I wanted to ask, how are Sophie and Connor? Because they've been uh, cropping up in all your talks. <laughs> well, just the day before we got on the airplane to come to New Zealand, Sophie and Connor and their mother, Kiki, our daughter, uh, went to Washington to participate in a march to the White House. Mm -hmm. To They didn't get arrested? No, we decided to not. We did go to the White House, but... When the policeman said, you can't stay on the sidewalk there, we obeyed their instructions. The prior time when I was protesting mountaintop removal, I sat down on the sidewalk yeah. and got arrested. But uh, So you're, you're having your 60s rather late in life, the 1960s coming to it late in life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we need. We, we're going to need people in the street the way they were in the 1960s to protest the Vietnam War We've got to get young people to see that this is a moral issue, at least comparable to that. Um, and they're going to have to understand that. And unfortunately, unless the government sees that, I don't think the governments will act. I've got this terrible feeling, and, and if I can borrow the, the title of your book, you talk about storms of my grandchildren. I've got a nasty feeling it's going to take a storm um, of some nasty climate event to to focus the the world's policymakers on on climate change and and what you tell us about the warming in the pipeline makes me fear that we've you know we're well on the way to seeing those but what i want to i mean you are offering us a message of hope here you think you think we can stop this thing and turn it around and have a better world well yes i think it's possible and and frankly i'm encouraged by the young people in new zealand i but it's going to take 
now a large number. Uh, and it's, of course, New Zealand can't do it alone. It's got to be uh, in many countries around the world. Um, yeah, a lot of people believe, as you said a moment ago, that it may take some real climate events to really energize the public. I hope that it doesn't take that. But in any case, we have to be moving the consciousness forward so that we can get action as soon as possible. I know that the 350 PPM organization um, that Bill McKibben set up has, has got some good sport in New Zealand and around the world. They've run some fantastic events. Um, and that may be one of the mechanisms that uh, can, can bring this change about. It's one of the mechanisms, but you know, the, the, peop the young people need to do more than say climate is important. They also have to know the kind of policies that are needed to effectively change the trajectory that we're on. Because if they just say, take actions, the politicians will say yes, and it will be greenwash. That's been the history so far. You can't leave the policy making to the politicians. So if you were king for a day, what would you do? Well, we would have to have a price on carbon. It has to be a simple, honest, rising carbon price. You want to have it gradual over time so people have a chance to adjust their lifestyles. Uh, and the business community has the opportunity to develop the innovations that will reduce uh, energy requirements and carbon requirements. But that's the thing required, because as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, somebody will burn them. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for finding the time to join us on The Climate Show. It's been a great privilege to talk to you, Jim, and I wish you the very best for the rest of your tour of New Zealand. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, well, that was um, one of the most interesting 30 minutes I've spent in a long time, that, uh, chatting with Jim Hansen at the University of Canterbury last week. And I just want to put a quick shout in here to the team that organized Jim's tour for um, really bending over backwards to make sure that the climate show was able to talk to um, Dr. Hansen. So to Cindy Baxter and Jeanette Fitzsimons and, and the crew, that's a big thank you. But particularly, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bronwyn Hayward um, of the University of Canterbury, uh, who was looking after um, Jim's visit to the university. Um, she, the university there has been struggling to get back to normal in the aftermath of February's earthquake. And Bronnie and her team were only actually allowed back into their offices last week. Um, so they were kind of cleaning up and doing everything, but they were really, really helpful. Um, were able to get us online and on air um, from the offices in the University of Canterbury. So a very big thank you to Bronnie and her team. Yeah, nice job. I only wish I could have spoken to him, but that wasn't going to be possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, we're living and we learn. Yeah. Well, I don't know why we don't have um, satellites and stuff for this show. Anyway. <laughs> Absolutely, or, or indeed super fast networks. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's fabulous to have him back. He's back from a rock and roll tour of Australia. <laughs> Normally what goes on tour stays on tour, but not in this case because we want all the stories. He's been releasing the book yeah. called Climate Change Denial, Heads in the Sand. It is John Cook from Skeptical Science. Hello, John. Can it's I go our in? very own best-selling author, John Cook yeah. from Skeptical Science. Well, let's not, jump, <laughs> let's not jump the gun. The book's just come out. <laughs> So you've been on tour. Um, it was released, what, about three, four weeks ago now, wasn't it? Well, I guess the, it's a little complicated because it's an English publisher and we're Australian and it's international. So so the book came out April 28 online and then we had a Brisbane launch on May the 4th and then a Sydney Canberra launch uh, on May the 15th and 16th. Well, tell us about that. How did it go? Well, it was great. Like the the Sydney launch we, uh, was on the Sunday night, so we had it at Glee Books, and uh, which had, they have a, this special room. It was quite quite big for a bookstore, and they had about 150 seats there because that's about how many people said they were coming, and they filled up. So they put in another 50 seats, and then they filled up, and then there was people standing at the back, and the booksellers told us that they had to turn a few people away. Huh. So we felt really bad for anyone who would have turned up for the launch that couldn't get in, but I guess it was a good problem to have in that sense. Yeah. Tell so how is, how, is, how is your signature now, John? 
you must have signed so many books. Yeah, I had to work out a, a book signing signature. That was a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the books had a, um, a really good reception, I have to say. Brian Walker reviewed it at Hot Topic and, and thought it was a, um, a, a most interesting and really well presented and written book. Uh, you, but you've been getting some great reviews around the place, haven't you? Yeah, that was a good review by Brian. It was so detailed that people almost didn't need to read the book because he'd uh, <laughs> summarized it so well. <laughs> oh, Brian will be mortified. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. But yeah, there was, there was some really good like before we released the book too, we sent it out to a, a number of scientists and and some really big names that gave us little blurbs to put on the cover. So so that was exciting, getting good feedback from all the all those people. Tell us, oh, actually, tell us a little bit about the book because uh, is it? I mean, is it a compilation of some of the best ofs from skepticalscience.com, or does it go down a completely different track? It's it's that's a small part of the book. Uh, the initial concept was. Hayden Washington uh, approached me. He had the idea of just doing a book about climate change denial. And what I'd been doing at Skeptical Science was basically explaining how uh, people, how climate deniers mislead through various arguments. And Hayden wanted to go deeper and explain why climate change denial was so, was prospering Mm. so much. So the basic premise of the book is to look at uh, the fact that we have a 97% consensus among climate scientists and yet among the general public there's only a, around a 50% consensus that humans are causing climate change and we just explore all the different reasons why climate denial is so popular at the moment and why science is, is getting more sure while the public is getting either less certain or, or just kind of hovering around that 50% mark. Does it go, does is it go there, into human nature at all? I mean, is it, is it, does it play into sort of our psychology? Yes, very much so. That was, that was what Hayden was really interested in. So my, what I contributed to the book was more the, the science, uh, exploring the si- climate science and, and picking apart the arguments of climate uh, denial. And what Hayden was investigating was, was the human psychology and, and the social science side of denial. Mm. And just looking at all the various different roadblocks that stop people from fully appreciating the reality of climate change. So we looked at external influences like the disinformation campaign that's fueled by fossil fuel industry and also mainstream media, which portray often portray climate change as, as a debate between skeptics and mm and climate scientists, which leave the public with the impression that there's a 50-50 debate, yeah. where there's actually a 97 to 1 debate with two undecided according to the surveys. So, yeah, so we looked at those external influences, but we also looked at uh, internal, I guess, psychological influences, such as ideology, which is probably the main internal driver where people who have conservative politics tend to be more skeptical about human caused global warming. Hmm. But then even if you get past the politics, there's just it's just a fundamental human nature that we we fear change. Uh, hu- humans tend to respond to weather more than climate. So we have trouble hmm. conceptualizing long term climate change and how that's going to affect us. And and even simple things like uh, people have a worry quota. We can we can only worry about so many things. So when when you um, try to talk to people about environmentalism, it's just oh, it's just one more thing to worry about, and all these things can combine and lead people to denying the basic science. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's, I guess it must have been a fascinating time for you, wandering around and meeting people who um, are your readers. Did you get lots of feedback on skeptical science itself? Yeah, I talked to John O'Connor or John Connor, who um, runs the Climate Institute. And he was he was quite familiar with skeptical science. Uh, probably my favourite part of the Sydney launch was uh, I talked a bit about how communicating climate science and and the different ways that we need to to just get the science out there to the public. And I mentioned the Twitter bot, which you guys had yeah. have featured on the show in the past. Yeah. And just when I just explained the concept of a, a Twitter bot that automatically finds denial myth, climate myths on Twitter and automatically responds to them, the whole audience just burst into spontaneous applause. <laughs> and, and Nigel's from Sydney, I was really hoping that he was going to be there and that would have 
I'm sure that would have encouraged him a lot, but unfortunately <laughs> he wasn't there. So I sent him an email after the launch just to to let him know. No, actually, I tweeted him to let him know that that, that there was such a positive response to his Twitter bot. Oh, cool. Did uh, did you get any haters on the road? Did you get anyone jumping up accusing you of um, I don't know, being a socialist or something? No, I didn't. Uh, on Sunday morning, I did an interview uh, with 2UE, which is a fairly conservative Sydney radio station that has a it's a commercial station that has a fairly large listenership, and I I, I invited 2UE readers to come along, and and afterwards I thought I wonder if there's going to be a few hecklers, a few 2UE <laughs> listeners come along and and give us a hard time, but. But nobody turned up, so it was a very it was a very positive audience at both Sydney and Canberra. It's, um, it's quite a notor- notorious station. Has it got has it got the guy called Alan Jones? Is it Alan Jones on it? No, no, he's at a different station. But no. they do have a another uh, presenter there, Jason Morrison, and he's made a few uh, comments uh, you know, to the fact that CO two is just a tiny part of the atmosphere, so therefore it mustn't mustn't yeah. cause war- yeah. it can't cause warming that kind of thing. Well, that that actually perfectly well, leads us on, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's where we're going next. We're going to um, the cl- climate myth, which is that CO2 increases um, happen after temperature change during the Ice Age cycle. Now, this is just to um, picking up on a story we carried in the last show, which was that some very high precision um, analysis of, of new cores from Antarctica showed that although there may well be a lag, it was probably 200 years or less. Whereas an, until um, until that um, study, the kind of consensus view was that it was somewhere around about 800 years, possibly 1,000 years of a lag between um, the, the, the beginning of a warming out of an ice age and the of an increase in CO2. So, okay, over to John. Okay, well, uh, I guess... Um in in our book, we talk about these different methods that, that climate deniers use, and the most common method is cherry picking. And this argument is a is a good example of cherry picking, where you just take one piece of evidence, and you come to a, a wrong conclusion. But if you look at all the evidence, you come to a completely opposite conclusion. So what this does is is look at the ice core records in Antarctica, and it finds that. Warming, go- warming happens first and then CO2 happens later. Now, there's a bit of uncertainty over the, the, dist- the difference between well, how long, the delay, how long it takes for the CO2 to go up from 200 years to up to 1,000 years. Mm. But, but that's not really that important. What, what is important is it, that does happen. Warming causes CO2 to go up. And so when we look over the last half a million years, we see that most of the time the Earth is in an ice age where uh, t- temperatures are uh, about five or six degrees cooler than, than current conditions. And then in between all these glacial periods, you have these warm interglacials. And we're currently in an interglacial right now. Mm. And if you look really closely at, at the, the temperature and the CO2 record, you see that CO2 does... Go for uh, no, warm, sorry, warming goes first, and then CO two comes later. Yeah. Now, what drives that is changes in the Earth's orbit. Uh, now, the the Earth's orbit changes in three different ways. There's the shape of the orbit, which is its eccentricity. There's uh, the tilt of the the Earth's, the Earth's uh, axis, and then there's a uh, oh, there's a third one. Now, can you bring up the next picture, yep. Glenn? Because I'm having a mental block here. Coming, coming your way. Yeah, there's the That's right. so, yeah, so there's yeah, there's the angle, the, the obliquity or the angle of the tilt, and then there's the precession, which is which is the direction that the the axis is pointing. Now these three different changes in the Earth's orbit all happen over different cycles between twenty thousand years, forty thousand years, and a hundred thousand years, mm. and they all combine in different ways. And the result is that around every 100,000 years, the South Pole receives more sunlight during spring. This causes um, the ice sheets to melt, the sea ice to melt, and and then that causes a feedback where the South Pole warms or, the, or just the general southern latitudes warm. 
and then when it warms, you get a positive feedback where the ocean starts to release carbon dioxide. And the, it was thought that this was mostly because as oceans warm, it, the solubility of carbon dioxide lessens. So it's kind of like a warm, warm coke. It just releases the CO2. But, but I have re read some other studies that say there are other factors like Arctic sea ice. When, as that disappears, that allows CO2 to come out into the atmosphere as well. So the main thing is we know that as it warms in the south, uh, the CO2 gets released. And what this causes to happen is with more CO2 in the atmosphere, that causes, it amplifies the warming mm -hmm. and it also spreads the warming to the north and all, other, all over the globe. So if you look, what skeptics are doing is just looking at the Antarctic uh, CO2 record. But if you look at the full record, what we find is, is the following story. The orbital changes causes the south to warm. That releases CO2 into the atmosphere, which amplifies the warming. Then the CO2 spreads through the, through the globe. And when we look at the equator, when we look at ocean sediments, we see that the CO2 rise happens at the same time as the warming. So, and then when we look at Greenland ice cores, again, that they basically happened at the same time. So, so we the whole record is is consistent with CO2 warming, and CO2 both dragging us out of the ice age and also spreading the warming across the whole planet. Huh. So, just going back to the graph um, at at the top, um, do we expect to see this this last peak where we are now to be because of man's influence? Do we expect that peak to be shorter? Uh, yeah, if if there was no human activity, there's there's a bit of argument over when we would have dropped back down in an ice age, but basically that whole issue is moot now because the the warming effect from CO2 is far far greater than any cooling effect from orbital changes. Okay. And and there is an argument. It's actually quite popular that that we're heading into an ice age or we should be worried about an ice age. If, if there was going to be an ice age pending, as, as it has happened over the last half a million years, the way that begins is in the north, the ice sheets around Canada um, and Europe would slowly be creeping southward. So if you're in Canada and you see ice sheets slowly approaching your house, then yes, you should be worried that there's an ice age coming. Mm. But what we are observing now is all the ice sheets up in the north are shrinking at an accelerating rate. So you can tick that off your worry quota. We don't have to worry about an impending <laughs> yeah. ice age. We're not, so we're not so much seeing sheets, we're seeing bergs heading our way. Icebergs, yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's right, yeah, floating down iceberg. and melting on their way. Yeah, yeah I, think it's, I, think it's, um, effect, I think several scientists have said that we have effectively um, postponed the next ice age uh, indefinitely uh, because it will take millennia for the... CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere to, to go unless we um, physically remove it ourselves, which is a bit of a big undertaking. Hmm. Yes, uh, I've, I've read one study that, that did the modelling on when we would drop back down into an ice age and it's basically hundreds of thousands of years. So, yeah, that's, that's not really on, on anyone's radar except sceptics who want us to keep emitting carbon dioxide. Hmm. Yeah, they're trying to make it's it's a debating point, isn't it? It's not it's not um, it's not a scientific point or a debate or, or an argument that scientists have. It's just a um, a statement that uh, deniers like to make because what they think they're doing is is well, they're trying to persuade people, aren't they? They're trying to um, they're not they're not really having an argument about science. Just to go back to the subject of your book. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and I guess there's there's a lot of techniques, but to, to try and distract people from the reality of global warming. But what I always try to bring back people to is we need to look at all the evidence and, and look at it all together. And so when we look at this whole CO2 lags temperature argument, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell us that carbon dioxide has no effect. It actually tells us the opposite, that, that carbon dioxide is a positive feedback. Mm. And, yeah. and with with the situation now, as the oceans are warming, as they're getting saturated with carbon dioxide, they're 
Because our CO2 emissions, a great portion of those are going into the oceans. The oceans are sucking it up. But slowly over time, they'll, they'll take up less of it. And, and that's another positive feedback. So the Absolutely. CO2 lag is actually a source of concern, not a source of comfort. Hmm. Yeah, now, whilst we're on the subject of that, um, I've, at the beginning of the show, I plugged the new Climate Commission report published today, John. Um, the, um, it's, the, it's a report called The Critical Decade, and I just thought I'd give it a bit of a plug here because it includes some fantastic graphics in there. And one of them is the, uh, that it impressed me anyway was the um, increasing ocean acidification that we expect over the course of this decade. It's kind of an inverse hockey stick with a, um, a very sharp right-angled blade pointing down. So, but anyway, I, I just wondered if that had made any news in your neck of the woods. The is that the Australian before. Commission? Yeah. Yeah, the Australian Climate Commission. I've heard, yeah, someone emailed me about it this morning, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. But, oh, well, that yeah, shows how, how, how ahead of the news we are. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> shows, how, that, shows how quickly I need to get the show out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, John, well, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I hope that the, um, the book continues to do well and uh, that the message gets out there. Thanks, guys. Don't forget the short URL either. Oh, yes. What is that, Oh, Gareth? ah, ah, sorry, yep. sorry. Hang on. It is. And I, I think it would be very appropriate to do it in a Monctonian manner because I gather that he's likely to head back to Australia, John. Yes, oh, he's uh, yeah. got a whole tour. And, in fact, his tour makes my tour look um, paltry in comparison because he's like doing the whole country over, over a couple of weeks, I think. Is he going straight is to it, Queensland? Because yeah. that's where all his friends seem to be. Well, there's a, a very uh, strong uh, mining industry in Western Australia who, who are involved in bringing him over. So he's actually starting in Western Australia at a mining conference and then drifting over to the east. Hmm. Oh, dear. Oh okay, dear. well, I shall give you the short um, URL for the discussion of CO2 legs. Um, a bit of an old leg, Mr. <laughs> Cook. Um <laughs> <laughs> HTTP colon forward slash a forward slash SKS dot TO forward slash LAG. Or lag. And um, there's also one for the book as well. Actually, so can you purchase the book from Skeptical Science? Well, if you go to that, our web page about the book, which is SKS dot TO slash denial. The, there's a link to our English publisher, um, there's a link to our Australian publisher, and there's a link to Amazon. So I think for anyone outside of Australia, the best place is probably either buy it from our, our English publisher who posts internationally, and if, or Amazon. If you worked it out right, oh. you'll also be an affiliate of Amazon, right? So that you also get the, you get the money from the sale, plus you get the affiliate link. Have you, have you organized that? Uh, yeah, if you yeah. click on the Amazon link, I think, I think so. Well, one, one, Still one figuring that out. One word of advice, John. Um, have a look at the Book Depository, which is a, a, a UK um, web book sales firm, and they ship free worldwide, and they also do very good affiliate deals. We're, we're, we're a, we use them at Hot Topic, and they're they're very effective. Well, I'll try to have them up. But I'll have a look at that and over the next couple of days and maybe have that up by the time this comes out. Excellent. Well, Glenn is going to be slaving away over a hot PC almost immediately um, yeah. in order that we get it out. So, I think so. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. look, many, many thanks for coming on, John. We'll speak to you in a couple of weeks. And um, just ask our viewers and listeners if um, there's anything they'd like you'd like uh, John to debunk. Just uh, drop us a line, comment on either theclimateshow.com or hot-topic.co.nz or at Skeptical Science. And uh, w your wish will be John's command. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. See you, guys. See ya. Cheers. So off goes John, and that leads us into the final segment for the show, the solutions segment. That's where we take a look at some green tech or new technology uh, that'll help us use less fossil fuels. And we've got a couple of good ones today, Gareth. First up, um, a new solar product. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's a, it's a development in um, capturing sunlight 
and it's a group at the uh, University of Missouri who've come up with a sort of um, a special design for an antenna using uh, nanotechnology <laughs> and I, I, I love this story partly because of what what their products called it's a, a nantenna hmm. or a, a, na <laughs> a nanotenna a nanotenna and a nan a nantenna. I used to have a nana. I didn't have mm. a nantenna. No. But nantennas basically use nanotechnologies to capture more of the incident sunlight. So typically the best solar panels today capture around about 20% of available light. If you could coat those um, panels with a nantenna, mm. this team says that they could capture up to 95% of the energy hitting the panel. Now it would do that by improving the solar, the, the, the photovoltaic uh, efficiency, which is the direct conversion of sunlight into electricity. But my reading is that this will also allow them to turn the heat, which is an important part of, 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 of the, the energy reaching the surface, and turn that into electricity as well. So what this um, development is, they've got some funding from the US Department of Energy and private investors to actually build an energy harvesting device. And they're hoping that within five years, they'll have a product that works with conventional solar panels. And it's a flexible film, so it could go on to roofs, it could go on to power vehicles. But if it does produce a, a big and significant increase in the efficiency of solar photovoltaics, what that will do is help to both um, generate more power per given um, area of, of panel, but also obviously bring the price down because oh, you're getting more power yeah that's so that's on. that it's always good and mm. and actually so solar photovoltaics and and the associated technologies there is such a huge amount going on in that area um that that it gives me some degree of confidence that we are going to end up with really efficient uh, solar collection technologies that will be you know fittable to your roof my roof um the car, you know, those sorts of things, those sorts of applications could become ubiquitous. And just looking at the technology that happens, I think it might happen rather sooner than we expect. Good, well, good. And as you say, if it brings down the price, that's that's got to be good. Um, yeah, well, it, mm. it, it's the big barrier, isn't it? You yeah. Know, it's what, one, if you've got to lay out $10,000 to buy, um, you know, some panels for the roof, but you're not going to get that money back in saved electricity for 10 or 12 years, that's, yeah, it, you might do it. You might not, but if it's you know a thousand dollars instead of ten thousand yeah. dollars, and you save the money, therefore in sort of two years, it becomes a bit more of a no-brainer, really. Yes, and we're all solar. We're all solar in this edition. Um, for, we are indeed. Yeah, um, the first large-scale twenty-four-seven solar power plant is to be constructed in the U.S. Yeah, in the last show we talked about Google making making an investment of 168 million dollars in bright source energy to build a Mojave Desert um, solar thermal plant, and this week we saw news of um, a 737 million dollar loan from the uh, Obama from the American government basically into a company called Solar Reserve, and they're building a large scale solar plant, but this one. Um, stores energy 24 hours a day so basically it works on the same principle as the bright source plant and i'm if glenn you've got the picture up i should think you have yeah, yeah. there it is you can see all these heliostats which are motorized mirrors and basically these mirrors track the sun and focus the light up onto the top of the tower there and that basically creates you know immensely high temperatures at the top of the tower that goes into a molten salt and that salt can be pumped around and basically holds the heat for long periods of time and so this plant can generate not only during the day but by using heat stored in its molten um, salt reserve mm. can actually make steam at night and generate power at night so that's what they mean by 24 7 solar power it's a solar power station that can give you deliverable energy light or day so um, obviously best so to do it in a desert because you'll get <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so these these panels that we're looking at, so they, they're actually solar panels as well as being mirrors? No, no, these are just mirrors. They're oh, motorized mirrors. mirrors. They're okay. mirrors on a special mounting with a little um, motor at the back. So as the sun crosses the sky, the mirror moves enough to focus its its beam directly on the That's funny because the they, they look like solar panels. You got, got, If you have a close look at the picture, if you're watching the live video stream, 
they, they actually, rather than being one big solid mirror, they're all they're divided up. Even uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's yes, that's just um, the angle of dangle, as it were. The, mm. I, we're not seeing them front on, as far as I know. I mean, obviously, yes, if you could um, reflect the light and also generate a bit of power at the same time, that might be a good idea. Yeah, but th these are these are basically highly efficient mirrors that um, that track the sun. Okay, very nice. That has been the solutions segment. Unless you've got anything else to add. Yeah, but no, very short and brief this week. But you know, I wanted the, the show has had its um, its high point in the uh, interview with Jim Hansen, and I don't want to detract from <laughs> Jim's message, which is basically that we we have to start on our um, emissions reductions sooner rather than later if we want to keep a planet that future generations can enjoy pretty much as you and I do, Glenn. Okay, well, I'm going to start after my trip to Japan then, because I'm off to Japan next week, and that's probably not yeah, going to do any good for the atmosphere. I shall plant a couple of trees on your behalf. <laughs> oh, thank you. Appreciate that. I don't have any room at my house, although I did just plant a <laughs> lime tree. Maybe that counts. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, um, excellent. So um, we will reconvene when uh, I get back, um, so that'll be in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, right, good. and don't forget you can check out all the show notes. So if you're just watching this on YouTube, you just happen to come across it, or you can find all the show notes over at theclimateshow.com and hot-topic.co.nz, and all the links to everything we've been talking about there, as well as the audio version as well. Also um, on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash theclimateshow and twitter.com forward slash theclimateshow as well. All right, Glenn. Many many thanks for that show. I've enjoyed today's. It's been good, and I I, I just I. Sort of, you know, I don't want to come over all sort of fanboyish, but talking to Jim Hansen was uh, definitely a highlight for me. I could tell. I could tell. Nice, <laughs> nice job. Good job. All right, Glenn. We'll speak to you soon. Have Thanks, a good Karen. time in Japan. Thank you. Cheers. See ya. What good is a drop in the ocean? What good is a drop in the ocean?